Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I, my name is Sarah Traver. I'm the director here at Traver Gallery, and it is my absolute pleasure to be here with our esteemed artist, Lynn Whitford, to walk through her beautiful exhibition, Still Life. Um, Lynn, you have been a gallery artist for many, many years, as many as I can remember, yes. certainly my whole life in the gallery. Yeah, and <laughs> yeah, more, probably more than that because since you were a baby yeah. when I had my first show. Yeah, exactly. Do you remember what year your first show was? I don't, and I think I have it, it seems like it might be wrong in my bio, I don't know. But <laughs> it was in the other space before you moved yeah, here. Yeah, in the so Belltown space, ago. so sometime probably in the 1980s. Yeah, you're, yeah, yeah. Um, so just a little bit of housekeeping so you all know what the program is like today. We're gonna walk through, Lynn and I are gonna walk through the exhibition together. We've got Deb on camera. She's gonna keep video on us and also on all the artwork so you can see Lynn's beautiful work even though you're not here in the gallery with us. And then at the end of the program, right around 12 o'clock, we'll jump online and we'll come on camera with you and invite you all to join us um, on your camera so we can see you and we'll do some question and answer. Um, for now, if you could all turn your um, turn on mute and turn off your video, that makes it easier for everybody. Hopefully you see a spotlight in the middle of your screen. Um, if you think of questions as we're walking through the show, feel free to drop them into the chat and we'll address them at the end of the program. Um, otherwise, feel free to ask your questions live to Lynn or I. Um, and I think that's it. I think we'll get, go ahead and get started. So Lynn, this, uh, this exhibition is a really special one. It represents about eight years of work in your studio. Yes. Um, and it's the first time you've had a solo show in that amount of time. We've had some work in group exhibitions yeah. and things, but this is a really monumental body of work. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, can you, the title of the show is Still Life. Can you talk a little bit about what you mean by that? <laughs> well, it has a lot of different implications. One is because I do make still lifes. Um, and I have from the very beginning when I was trying to figure out how to make with my technique, ordinary looking things, something that anyone wanted to look at. So I began putting them into still lifes as though they were um, three-dimensional paintings and I still do some of that but the other thing is we got through the pandemic and we're still <laughs> alive and the other thing is that I now know I have a terminal illness and but, and here you but are I still have life <laughs> yeah as long as I have it I have it. so I'm trying to be as present as I can be as long as I can be well thank you for um allowing us to host this exhibition. I know oh, it's... The, it is such a pleasure. This gallery is the best gallery I've ever seen and the owners are the <laughs> best owners. So I... Well, we're gonna, we'll try not to get too emotional <laughs> in this walkthrough, but I am also not gonna not be personal about this. Um, you, Lynn and her family has been uh, close to the Traver family. Uh, for my entire life. Yeah. And so this is a particularly poignant exhibition for us mm -hmm. to be able to host. And we had the honor of hosting the entire Whitford mm -hmm. family, Lynn's family. Zillions of us. <laughs> and in-laws and extended family um, over the last couple of days. So it's been quite a celebration. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, and I would also say that as we walk through this exhibition, we'll probably call out a lot of the titles because not only is the exhibition title a play on words and <laughs> a little bit of poetry, but that's true of all of Lynn's work. There's really layers and layers of meaning within your work and um, the way that the pieces function together. And um, it's really amazing. So, And in fact, the name is often the starting point for a piece. I have a concept. I have an I think of a name that captures some of it, and then I go from there to think about how I can give it form. Yeah. <laughs> well, let's start um, by taking a look at this piece. This is a really personal piece. This one has on in the surface a poem by my mother, Gwen Seidel, which is called The Heart, of it. The Heart Should Be a Secret Thing. And the poem 
as you turn the turntable, which it's on, you can read the poem, which goes around. And I hand wrote the poem on the metal. So do I need to explain the process? If you, I mean, <laughs> Talk a little bit about the piece here, and then I think we will talk a little okay. bit about the process because okay. it's um, it's an amazing process, and you are a master of this craft. So I write the poem. I wrote the poem on the bottle and then etched it. So the where I've written it, I've written it with a pen, which is a resist to mm -hmm. the acid that it goes into. So everything but the lettering gets eaten off a little bit so that the lettering is raised so you can read it. So the poem goes around here, but on the inside, you can take one out. So the, all the pieces on the inside have fragments of letters my mother wrote and each someplace in there, each of the grand or grandchildren yeah. is mentioned. And my Dear Elizabeth, is, yeah. And some, there are a few newspaper articles that one written about her when she was performing as Lady Macbeth. And so there, and when she was in a play, she was engaged and the person in the play was <laughs> also engaged. They're just funny kinds of things. But, there, but the point is that the poem is about the heart should be a, the secret thing. She was a very private person. So these are kept inside where only people who are allowed to pull them out can see them. So that was the concept. Yeah. And so this one eventually should go to somebody in my family. Somebody mentioned in the inside because she was a powerful, interesting, private, emotional woman. Yeah, and she was an artist. She was an artist. She was both a, a painter and a poet. And so and you grew up with your mom being a creative person and making mm -hmm. artwork around mm -hmm. you your whole mm -hmm. life. Mm -hmm. Do you think that um, shaped how you approach art? It probably did, but I didn't know it. I mean, and, and I'm not artistic in the way she is. She could look at anything. She could see people and come home and draw them recognizably, really recognizably. If she'd ever witnessed a crime, the criminal would have had no hope because <laughs> <laughs> she could have come back and drawn that person I don't have that at all. I don't have a good visual memory. But on the other hand, I did grow up around art and I started out as a music major, then I switched to history, then I went into social work and then I got into weaving and then I got into metal work and I found my, the kind of thing I can do. Hmm. <laughs> and it combines words and form. I don't think I knew um, your past having studied <laughs> history and social work um, but that's pretty interesting because that comes through pretty strongly in the work <laughs> as well. Um, can we talk about this sure. piece over here? Yeah. Okay, this one is called How Could We Have Known? And it's one I did, a, I started a series of pieces trying to refer to the horrible things that humans are doing to the world in terms of global warming and this is a destruction of things. So this one, they're supposed to look like the kind of way you would see bottles washed up on a beach, but mm -hmm. underneath each one is an image. Like this one is an image of a GMO cornfield. And can I? Sure, yeah. And that one is a burnt forest where you just see the the bear. The bear trees. The bear trees the forest fire image. This one is hard to read, but it is actually a destroyed, a bombed village. Oh, so wow. it's just wreckage, but you see stairways and pieces of houses. All the various ways that, yeah. we are, that we're destroying everything, including ourselves. Uh, this one is cracked earth and it has fragments of a newspaper article about drought and temperature change, climate change. Hmm. And the last one is a traffic jam. <laughs> <laughs> How do you source your imagery for these? Are these taken you from? You know, I've gotten help from wonderful uh, librarians. I go to the hmm. library and I mean, sometimes I find them in the newspaper and 
take them from that. But other things, I've gone to the library and asked the librarians to help me find the, a piece we'll see later that has images of fires. I couldn't find anything that looked like it would be legible when it was etched. So a librarian helped me find a very a book about old firefighters hmm. and their artist renderings of fires, which were perfect, which worked much better. Yeah. yeah. So sometimes sometimes newspapers, sometimes books, but librarians have been really. I love librarians. Yeah. And so this um, this is a similar process that you're using to transfer. You're doing an etching here. Yeah. Um, and so you do some sort of an image transfer, I imagine. Yes, and the image transfer, um, there is a kind of paper you can get, a, it's a plastic kind of, so it has a film on it that is a resist hmm. and you can put your a clean flat piece of metal, you can put that image on top of it and um, heat put it onto a heating plate, just the right temperature, not too hot, not too cool and burnish it on. And so the resist part transfers onto the metal. Mm -hmm. And then when you put it into the acid, that part doesn't, it's just kind of tricky because it's hard to get it all to transfer. Well, sometimes sure. I have to use a pen and fill in some yeah. spaces, but anyway. It's amazing. Yeah, it's a wonderful technique. And that's something, you know, I have studio mates who know a lot of things I don't. I know some techniques and they know some. So we can teach each other and help each other. And there's one good Xerox machine for this, which is at the technical college. And so one of my studio mates who takes classes there does a Xeroxing for me and that kind of thing. You know, it's a team I, I realized during the pandemic yeah. that how much I mean I knew I would never have done a studio alone. I like working with other people doing their own thing around me. But I also realized how dependent I am on other people. It's like, what do you think about this? How, is, how does this look? Or how would you do such and such? And they, hmm. so I didn't do much work during the pandemic. I started just getting too depressed. And um, for those of us who are joining who might not know you, where is your studio? My studio is in Madison, Wisconsin, <laughs> which is where I was born and probably where I'll die. But it's, um, it's a studio in an old bus station, and we are five metalsmiths and a hat maker. And very, we sign, have to sign a lease, of course, with all kinds of terms on it that <laughs> sure. we can't understand. But anyway, we have, it's a good landlord, and um, a lot of, there's a brewery and a distillery and two bakeries and all kinds of different businesses in the building. and. Uh, and then we got together informally. We don't have any interview process. Somebody knows somebody who might, it works really well. Mm -hmm. We don't have any meetings. We don't have any formal agreements and we get along. That's mm -hmm. awesome. Get along really well. Um, let's, let's keep looking at the show. Let's, um, this is a really striking piece. It's so graphic. <laughs> <laughs> in a way. The title of it is Divided We Stand. It has both, I, I see it both as a having to do with personal relationships mm -hmm. and the kind of prickly nature that people can have in a relationship and also internally, mm -hmm. but also very much politically. Yeah. But it's just where we are. As it a totally, as a country. Sure. I mean, that's how I yeah. like. But here we are, we're standing. Here we are, we're standing, yes. Yeah. And, the, and they are still together, but the, the, it's made, the bottle was made and then cut in half and then I soldered inside on, but they have, I drilled lots of holes and put little tiny nails through and then actually glued them in from the inside before I glued hmm. them on and then painted them red. Amazing. And then there's a series of work here that we kept together as sort of a little garden. Yeah. <laughs> um, although I'm not sure that's what you intended with it, but we but thought that it was makes sense. kind one, of an interesting. Yeah. Partly because these are made of pewter, which is the second. I work in mostly in copper and brass, um, but pewter is a very different metal. I, and I can't make the same kinds of things out of pewter that I can make out of copper and vice versa. So 
yeah, these are part of the, what I call a persistence of, this is part of persistence of weeds as is that one. And these are part of the um, anxiety about the, <laughs> what's happening with, the, with science and with GMO yeah. crops. And these are, this is called crispr miniolas. So they're miniolas that, I don't think these are done yet, but they're bred to be genetically modified to be square, square for, for shipping purposes. Tomatoes, square tomatoes have been made. <laughs> and so the, this one, the tomato one, uh, first they came for the tomatoes is, <laughs> <laughs> is that one. And then one of my studio mates is married to a wonderful wood, actually a couple of them are married to woodworkers, but uh, three of them. But one of them makes the boxes for me cool. when I need them and the wooden shelves. Mm -hmm. it's, He's nearby and he does a beautiful job and he's made my shelves. This base and this base are from a factory that closed, uh, which did sand casting and they're the sand casting forms and they're so oh, no way. beautiful. They're so beautiful. They have that old, um, and they were functional pieces and I was able to buy a lot of them. And then this one I had slate into the inside, but hmm. you'll see a lot of those. So the ones that are newer looking are made by Kevin hmm. and uh, the old ones I'm running out of them. But, and then this one even has on the front of it, the, um, I've darkened it's, it, but there are the numbers that had to do with the casting yeah. on this. I don't know if you can get around to see the sign, but so just mysterious markings on them, which I love. And so tell me a little bit about the persistence of weeds. This, uh, the one that Deb has her camera on right now is, um, is that a pomegranate? Yes, a pomegranate, which I cast out of pewter. I, okay. from a, I made from a, real, from a real from a real pomegranate. Yeah. And then one of my studio mates made the wonderful uh, garlic mustard seedlings, hmm. <laughs> um, which are coming out of it. And then she also made the, this Agnes Che made the sprout that's coming hmm. out of the rotting potato. And the idea is, my idea was that I understand why people get rid of invasive plants in some places, but I also have read enough about weeds to know that the reason they're successful is because they have incredible survival skills. So after there's a city's been bombed, something will grow out of the mm -hmm. destroyed houses. Hmm. And, uh, and those are the tough things, you know, that we may be grateful to the garlic mustards, but we <laughs> ruined everything. So that was my idea about it. And, and also I see a parallel in uh, the way we talk about immigrants hmm. is a, like, who's an immigrant? You know, people, everybody came from someplace. Right. We've moved as long as humans have been alive with waves out of Africa and we're mixed. And where do you decide at what point is something native? I mean, right. Very few of us. Gosh, these pieces feel especially poignant mm -hmm. given everything that's happening in Ukraine right now. Yeah, absolutely. Invasion of yeah. Ukraine. So, I mean, I've always thought what I've loved about when I was a kid, what I thought was great about the United States was we came from everywhere. Right. I loved it that we had in my classroom, they'd say, Where are you from? And you'd name all the places that you knew you had ancestors from. And the more you had, the Higher, <laughs> more higher points to guys. <laughs> so I don't understand at all why anybody doesn't want people to come no. from everywhere. Everybody brings their richness. Have you always felt engaged with politics and yeah. social justice? From a very early age, when I was in junior high, I used to go to political rallies. Mm -hmm. I had two Republican friends and one Democratic friend, who was very political, and we would take our signs and, and then of course I came of age during the Vietnam War mm -hmm. and was in college at a school that was very active in anti-war stuff and I was out there with my signs and marching and so on I did not imagine we would go so backwards yeah look like well speaking of that <laughs> should we look at the next, <laughs> the next piece next one. titled Mr. Backwards <laughs> Shy with Vladimir yeah there's no shortage of political commentary in your work. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and this, this one. This one is particularly obvious. It's a sort of samovar. And uh, this one, uh, I had, again, help from studio mates. 
uh, one of them, Ginny Whitman, helped me with the hands. I don't do casting at all. I never did. Mm -hmm. I mean, I learned it in grad school and I was at, did once. So I need help with the ca casting, but she also helped shape the hands to make them, the fingers shorter and the <laughs> <laughs> short fat hands for the handles. And then this piece I actually was able to order from eBay, which is exactly what I love. It's perfect. Uh, wow. This bout. And then the feet I made and somebody else cast and um, the and coin I happen to have from a trip to Russia. It's a, a ruble uh -huh. on the top. And on the base, there are words that I call Trump word salad, which are an assemblage of words said by the man himself. Which really are, <laughs> when you read them insane. with zero context, oh. make zero sense. Not that they made a lot of sense yes. even in context, but um, I'm gonna tell a funny story and sorry, Sammy, she <laughs> might not <laughs> like me for it, but. Uh, we were putting together all of your artist materials for this exhibition and um, going through all of the beautiful poetry and text that you provided that goes along mm -hmm. with the work. And then came to this one, which was called Word Salad. And mm -hmm. Sammy, our gallery manager, was reading through it and said to me, I, something's up with this. This doesn't make sense. Everything else Lynn's written is so beautiful and, <laughs> and concise and makes sense. And this just- Here she's talking about the size of her crowd. <laughs> And, uh, and I read it and I was like, oh no, no, no. I think those are Trump quotes. <laughs> so I hand wrote them, they're, they're not legible. You can read some of them, but you yeah. can't read a lot of them with the pot on here. But, um, but I did put them like on my website and they're in here written out, but I hand wrote them around the base um, in concentric squares. So they go from one point all the way to the inside and they're just, I have to also point out the little tail on the back of this piece. It's so good. <laughs> I love that you are able to find humor in darkness, Lynn. That is the only way to keep going. Is so um, it's one of the really beautiful things I think about your work is that it equally occupies those spaces. Like there is a um a real truth and poignancy to the work and also a wonderful levity to it you know it, it i always feel like art i mean if any if you if you're doing posters or big things outside you can just have them be blatantly political and they're very useful for motivating people but in the gallery you have to make people want to look at it so there has to be something that draws people in mm -hmm. to engage with any political or psychological or whatever content you hope they see right <laughs> um how about this piece i need my space <laughs> that name actually was inspired by one of the grandsons who is 15 who likes to be with people but needs to retreat now and then and mm -hmm. he said to me at some point yeah we need our space and i was thinking i mean a lot of us feel that way at some point but um so that was the idea that they're they're <laughs> they're overlapping, they're encroaching on each mm -hmm. other's space here. <laughs> I think this is an interesting piece to kind of point out how you use the bottle forms mm -hmm. um, as a stand-in for figures. Yeah, yeah, and human relationships. Yes, yeah. Um, and this actually might be a good time to talk a little bit about how you actually make these forms. Okay. Um, the technique is called hollowware and can i take one of these sure, off sure. sister yeah, let's do that. and it's not done by very many people anymore hundreds of years ago it was i think much more common because that's how cooking pots were made mm -hmm. but the university of wisconsin had fabulous professor fred fenster who taught this technique and i started out with i did two semesters with eleanor modi who's absolutely wonderful and got me drawn into switching from fiber to metal mm -hmm. and then I took Fred's class and started hammering like yes <laughs> <laughs> I mean I've never been able to manage things like meditation or <laughs> kinds of things I know work for calming people but they don't 
worked for me. I mean, I can't have not made myself be able to do that. But hammering is as close as I can come to meditation. Mm -hmm. And so it is quite a meditative process, some of sure. it, especially that when you get to the final, what's called planishing, where you're doing little tiny overlapping blows. Anyway, I loved it. So I never turned back. <laughs> so um, so these are made, do you start with a flat sheet of copper? You start with a flat sheet of copper and it's, uh, I, it's hard to just, it's called 18, 18 gauge, but I don't know any other way of describing the thickness. It's not super thin. The copper is a soft metal until you hammer it, at which point it hardens. So hmm. you start with the, I have a whole lot of things that are called tea stakes that are big steel forms that are shaped like a T and you can put them into a vise and then you, you anneal the copper, which means you heat it up to red hot and then cool it. And you draw concentric circles around it with a dividers scratch into the surface. Mm -hmm. And then um, you start, you hold it and start with the center and you hit it a little bit and turn it and hit it a little bit and turn it and hit it. So after you've done the whole surface, it's slightly dish shaped. And then you keep doing that 50 times or 20 times or whatever you need to get the form you need. So if you're doing a shallow one, it's not mm -hmm. so long. If you're doing the kind I do where the circumference would have been, you know, maybe 28 inches or something, and you have to bring it up. So it's, it's going to be nine inches when you finish, you're com mostly compressing it, but you're also stretching it a little bit. Mm. So, so the flat sheet and this one came finally the, the shape of the bottle wow and then once you get the rough shape you use a different kind of hammer and put it onto a surface that it fits onto smoothly and then you do the tiny overlapping blows to smooth the surface and then if you want to you can also eventually file it but i usually don't have to file it um, and then the other parts like the neck uh, learned how to draw the form to bring the metal around to get roughly you draw it and then I won't explain all that but <laughs> there's a way to figure out how to get the shape you want and um, and so you do the same you, you bring it around and then use the stake to hammer it to get it as perfect as you can and then you silver solder mm -hmm. it. it's a high temperature solder I have a big natural gas torch mm -hmm. and natural gas and compressed air torch which is a a safe, a large flame and quite safe to use. Even the grandkids have used it. Um, and it's in a big fume hood. And so then those pieces are made separately and soldered, not silver soldered on, like the, the rim of it. And eventually you solder the neck onto the bottom. Hmm. Then with these, I cut them with something called separating discs. It's a, you use it in a flexible shaft, which is you step on something and it goes around and the discs wear out quickly and you keep replacing them. So you can cut through and then put it on. We have sandpaper glued down and you sand it until it's really flat. And then you cut the disc and solder it on. It. And then you, I mean, it's kind of insane, but. <laughs> it's kind of insane. So how long does it take you to make? You know, I've carefully not ever <laughs> kept track of it. Probably wise. <laughs> so the pieces are expensive and the, and the hourly wage is terrible. <laughs> We were once asked in our building if we could if we'd have could have an apprentice or somebody who could learn like you really want to teach somebody who needs a good job how to do something that takes five years to learn and earn your less than minimum wage. I don't think so. It's an incredible craft. But incredible. anyway, I love doing it and I can do it because my husband's salary was enough for the family and mm -hmm. I can earn enough to pay the rent. Hmm. Studio rent. Well, let's so, keep let's keep walking through because we only have a couple more minutes before yeah. we want to take questions. Okay. Um, are there a couple pieces that you want to mention in here? Oh. Well, maybe this one right here because this is there's only one from this series in the show, but this one called "Spin the Bottle." The surface is covered. I I etched onto it words that I collected from. Uh, leases and all kinds of legal documents, the kind of things we all have to sign in order to do anything. Mm -hmm. we, we read and agreed to whatever that we can't understand. And if we spent our, if we actually read all of them, we spend years of our life reading them. So to me, that kind of language is what is 
separating us from ourselves. It's leading to the depersonalization that is so common. So I collected those words and put them. So they're beautiful to look at, but the the language mm. is <laughs> you would recognize it. All of you would look at it, would recognize <laughs> it. And I did a couple of others, one called What is Your Birthday Cake that has mm -hmm. medical kinds of stuff. That, are you feeling on a scale of one to ten? Mm -hmm. The things you have to sign anyway. So I did a whole series of those. And these are also sand casting forms, these beautiful things. Yeah, they're such things they're in. So and do you add the color to the surface of those? You know, the blocks? yellow one, I sometimes touch it up a little bit, hmm. but they and this one I changed a fair amount. I don't remember what it was. I added the that color. And this one I just uh, added darkened the black, mm -hmm. not darkened, but filled in some of the spaces. But basically that one I think was pretty much and the red that's in the inside was there. Wow. Those apparently told something to the people doing the, the casting. So but, like it was coding yeah, in it some was way. Coding, yes. Yeah. So they're I think they're stunning. And then they also have on the sides these uh, metal tags this one says paste and mm -hmm. i they, i just love them because they're beautiful and mysterious and i know that they were functional which yeah. makes it even makes me happy and then maybe if we just talk about a few um this one is another obviously this really is political one about the state of the country. Such a beautiful piece. Thank you. And the surface, this patina was then you boil the metal and the, the chemicals, and it does this nice unevenness that uh, I like. It's called the body politic. There's something um, that wedge shape, that harsh uh -huh. geomet yeah. geometric wedge dividing mm -hmm. that beautiful, curvaceous yeah. vessel is yeah. like. Mm -hmm really poetic <laughs> and harsh yeah, you know it is. yes um the other thing i love about this piece is the way i mean you could have just left it at that but the this separation here and the way yeah. these just are about to fall away from yeah, each other yeah yep it seemed as good a way to picture what the country feels like during has felt like during the pandemic yeah sure. Um, there's one piece in here that's very much about COVID. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Can we talk a little sure. bit about yeah. that one? Yeah. This is a good example, I think, of the where that seriousness and humor coincide. <laughs> these the these sweet little family groups. <laughs> Who are standing on the circles that we used yeah. to see painted? In totally ubiquitous. You can stand there with your people, yeah. and so another group is there. And yeah, people did what they had to do to get together, and each one wearing each a one mask. Wearing a mask, yeah, and the kids' masks are kind of falling. <laughs> it's, so, it's so wonderful. <laughs> so, did you find during the pandemic that you were able to get into the studio and make you know, work? I, and... I could totally have gotten in there, and I didn't. I just got too depressed. I yeah. stayed home and did uh, jigsaw. Probably. You know, I think that that um, we've really found that it's been a total mix with artists. There were some artists who found that that time yeah. was really massively productive time for them in the studio, and an equal number that said yeah. exactly what you're saying, which is, yeah. it wasn't. I couldn't create my mind was elsewhere yes, and, it was... and my studio mates were mostly not coming in and when we did we wore our masks and stayed eight feet apart and yeah most we didn't see each other much and i just it it made me realize what i i knew but i knew it vividly then which is i am a deeply social person i have a pretty small circle i only want to see the people that you I, really, I care, really about. care about <laughs> but i want to see them a lot yeah and i miss people and if it hadn't been for at least that I had a good husband to share a house with, yeah, I wouldn't have made it. But yeah. and kids, Zoom calls with the kids and grandkids. Yeah. Which is so you're uh, Bill, your husband yeah. is an amazing person as well. Yeah, Can you just share a little bit about what he does and how that informs your work. Well, he's a retired law professor and 
we have similar values, but different approaches of the world. I'm very much a bottle is half empty and he's very much a bottle is half full. So on the average, we're kind of maybe, maybe <laughs> we level each other out. <laughs> yeah, and he's a really good um, caretaker. So. Yeah. And connecting, he has a much bigger circle and he is better than I at doing Zoom calls and phone calls and meeting people outside. Yeah, so he pushes the social things a little more than I'm comfortable with, which I'm sure is good for me. And then together, you guys have four kids. Four kids and seven grandkids. And seven and grandkids. Four kids have four partners we love and we love their yeah. family. So we're just extremely so, lucky on that and score. Everyone is incredibly socially and politically engaged in yeah, the world. And we share a lot of values and and information you know with one another yeah so that's been my that is my salvation and the thing i care most yeah about. and um as an observer of your work i think it makes it all of that makes its way into your work at least i see that good a lot okay. so yeah um i think it's time for us to go back okay. and answer some questions okay uh so we're gonna jump off this camera and we'll see you on the other camera in just a second hi everyone um I am going to invite you all to join on camera so that Lynn and I can see your beautiful faces if you're willing to join us. You'll probably see some common names, some familiar Emily. names. Emily is in Uganda. Oh, cool. <laughs> oh, Pauline is in New York. Hi, y'all. Thanks. <laughs> hey, everybody. Um, Feel free if you have any questions for Lynn or comments you want to share, drop them in the chat or just join us uh, and say them out loud. Put, take yourself off mute and speak up. Well, Lynn, I have questions. It's Holly. Can you see me? Oh, your name's on here. I do, yeah. A lot of <laughs> you, okay. You know, I was trying to do it through the chat. Can, can you hear me? I, I'm not sure. Can you hear Holly? Holly, are you, I think you're muted. I'll unmute you. Where are you? Here you go. Okay. Hey, Holly. I nice unmuted you myself. Oh, there we go. There. Okay. okay. We can hear you now, Holly. Will you start over? Okay, sure. I was trying to ask questions through the chat, but um, so first of all, there was an image under the pomegranate. What was that image under there, that surface plate? Oh, it's the slate. It's just a piece of slate. Oh, okay, it's, it's beautiful. A beautiful. Piece of slate that was I yes. guess fit into the the square. Yes. Okay. Well, I have to say your show looks so amazing, and those bottles that are sunken into the sand, and the way they that you've placed them and everything, I, they just look so beautiful. Um, there's a piece that you didn't talk about that I'm curious about that I saw on the website that's called um, Bottle Half Full. Bottles Half Full, I think it's in this show. It was bottles that were filled with a wooden bottle, a half bottle with a wooden oh, bottle. It, that's not the name of it, but- um, Oh. The one that's, it is in the show. It the is. one that were the, has wooden forms that were turned and then half bottles, it's a- Yes. Yes. It um, is in the show. Um, yeah, we just didn't have time to talk about it. We yeah, can, sure. I'll okay, put she's going to walk I'll, over. It, yeah. And then will you read the title on it? Because it's a, it's a double title. Your titles are really great. The way that you use words with the images has really great. I mean, I've just kind of watched that whole process <laughs> continuing and it keeps getting more and more layered. So if you can see Deb's camera, she's looking at the piece yeah. that Holly was mentioning. Okay. And so on the back side of that piece, you'll see. Will you read the or put the camera on the title as well? Yeah. So the sound of loneliness is actually a line oh. from a country western song that I love. And the reason Ode to George Siegel is because I always saw his many of his sculptures as people who were close to one another, but encased in a way that they couldn't quite oh. connect and wanted to, but couldn't. And that's what this one, I have the, the beautiful wooden colored bottles, which I colored that are 
behind the metal forms and they're attached to the base so they can't get closer, hmm. but they're there. The, the beautiful forms are there, um, kind of kept. Apart. That makes and total like, sense to me now. I do remember that the title had to do with George Siegel. I yeah. forgot. But I um, yeah. work. and a lot of people didn't see that in the work, but I always felt like those people were encased and they couldn't quite get out to each other. And a lot of the pieces I do have to do with, I mean, to me, the most important thing is connecting with other people. And one of my brothers once said, when I'm alone, I don't exist. It's not quite true of him. It's not quite true of me, but it's close <laughs> that to me, we are, we are just our connections. That's what makes us who we are. And so a lot of the work has to do with that and the fear of isolation and being alone and the joy of having people you love around you. And I'm not trying to say, I wanna say just one last thing about your work that your colors are beautiful. Your patinas are amazing. And um, those modeled patinas and the subtlety between the, um, like the bottles that were, um, from your grandson saying, I need my own space, like those colors within that particular piece. I make piece. by burying the pot in, in sawdust with chemicals in it, so it gets a speckle. Yeah. The sawdust, the other beautiful. Yeah, it's be beautiful. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. beautiful. Um, Thanks, Ali. Thanks, Ali. Uh, Demily or Demily? Demily. Oh, you've got your hand up. Did you want to say something? Emily, are you there? Emily is in Uganda. <laughs> Amazing. I don't know if we can. We're not getting her. We can't hear you, but join us if you. Um, Maybe she can. Can she join? If there? you want to type something into the chat, that'd be great as well. Oh, here she says. Hi, all. Brad, I I'm see you've got your hand up. Him. Okay. If you can unmute, we'd love to hear from you. Even okay. after the pandemic, it's, it's I really know. hard. I can't even do this. <laughs> uh, Steve said, I'm, oh, I'm unmuted on my end. Okay, we okay. can hear you now. Perfect. Okay, great, great. Um, yeah, I First a quick comment and a quick question. Um, the, the comment is, uh, I really appreciate the the combination of the technical skill in uh, in your art, but also the emotional background to it. Um, I think I'm I'm progressing on the technical side, but I haven't got the emotional part yet. I really appreciate the combination of both those. Um, Be a while. <laughs> the 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 technical question I have is I I actually use a technique somewhat similar to what you're using, but I'm curious when you do the handwriting, what are you using as the resist? Um, there's they're oil based pens, and I can't remember what they're called, Holly might remember. But anyway, you can buy at our stores a fine pointed oil-based pen, which is holds up long enough for you to do the etching. And so I can just hand write with that. And that, when I put it into the acid, that lasts pretty long. Sometimes you have to pull it out and look and some of it's coming off and you add more of the pen to it, but it's good. Sure, sure, okay. Yeah, I use some want to know the name, pen. if you wanna email me, I think it's on my website and you, I can, tell you what they're called. I just don't remember. Okay, great. Thank you. I'll do that. Okay. Anybody else want to jump in? Oh, Emily, I'm sorry that we weren't able to hear from you. We're trying to get that worked out. If you can type your question into the chat, that would work. Mm -hmm. Hey, Lynn, it's Michael. Hey, Michael. Hi, hey. I'm Susan. Hey. Brad was just talking, if you ever get a chance to see his sundials, they're really great. I'm but sorry, who is? Oh, that, okay. Brad, oh. but um, um, I, uh, um, I, I was really sick, so my speech is slower um than it was a week ago um oh 
I was looking for your website mm -hmm. and I, it didn't come up. I, the Traver site comes up and your show. Just, just put in www.lynnwhitford.com. Okay, She's thanks. There. Hey, I'll, thanks. And that has all the old work, work that was in other shows and work that's been in no shows and work yeah. that everything is there. And the words, if you go down to the bottom of the website, if you put the cursor down low, there's a something you can click on that'll pull the words up for the ones that have poems and that kind of thing. So should be there. Okay. And I, Michael and I had the first show I had, Trevor Gallery, it was Michael and I together. He's also a wonderful metal smith. And he's got a neurological disease, a mysterious one. These nerves. Nerves. <laughs> yeah. Very the bad. bad. Deal. <laughs> yeah. So the other thing is, is the recording of this going to be up to? Yes. Great. Yeah. We're going to, um, it takes us usually several days to kind of do the editing and stuff and get it up. It's a little bit of a time consuming process, but it will be up on our website as soon as we can and we'll send an email out about that so okay great thanks and good to see you yeah uh Tamale says thank you lynn for taking us through your work all of them are great pieces but i really like how did we get here and your mom's oh, well. <laughs> oh thank you <laughs> yeah thank you Tamale has stayed with us in wisconsin and we visited amazing She's a wonderful dear friend kind of family yeah. also. Yeah. And Lynn Seeley, thank you for your comments also. Um, she was in Seattle and walked through the show and okay. saw your work and um, has a piece by you that's wrapped with a long strip of copper with many, many words oh, on it. Oh, yeah. yeah. OK, wonderful. Yeah. Um, it's, um, it's time for us to jump off here, but I want to thank everyone for um, for joining us today. This is a really special walkthrough and a really amazing opportunity to get to learn more about your work, Lynn, and your process and your thinking. It's really Thank amazing. You. It's an opportunity to really kind of dive into, I feel like your inner world. And, uh, and to have it in the gallery, you know, when I make the pieces, I put them on a shelf in the studio and then box them up and put them in my attic. So to actually see them all displayed the way they should be with <laughs> light and space is such a treat <laughs> they look kind of new to me as well like, wow <laughs> it's fun for us too and it really is a beautiful show it's like a museum exhibition congratulations uh, and i would encourage we really only got to look at a handful of pieces today so i would encourage you all to get on the website our website and lynn's website and um do a deeper dive on the individual artworks because there's a lot a lot of information in there okay thank, thank you, you all you. Bye. Bye.